invited to talk by Martin Kurpas from University of Silesia. And he's going to be talking about spin orbit coupling and spin mixing in elemental two dimensional materials. Okay, okay. So as I said, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to show you the results of my uh, last few years, what I've been doing. So what I will show is, has been done with, together with Paolo, Faria, uh, Martin from uh, Regensburg currently, uh, Martin Mitra from Slovakia uh, in Kosice, and Jaroslav Fabian also from Regensburg. So let me now introduce when I came from. I come from Poland, which is the border between Central and Western Europe. And I come from uh, Upper Silesia, which is here in the south of Poland. And in the 19th century, it used to be very heavy industry uh, area with, you see how was the, with the uh, lots of mines and smelters. So the quality of air was not very good. Uh, but since then a lot of things changed and now uh, many of those mines are closed and some of them were transformed into museums which are really nice but uh, what is nice about those museums you can not only uh, visit them from the let's say outside but you can also go 300 meters underground and have a let's say have an opportunity to taste how the miners work look like so we can really go there dressed like a miner and, and experience this dust and everything <laughs> so in Katowice we also have a very famous uh, event arena which is called Flying Pot and this is very often a place when Brazil and Poland volleyball teams play against each other and finally in the town nearby Katowice in Hozhów there is the center of interdisciplinary research which to which the Institute of Physics was recently moved in okay so let me now give uh, some justification or motivation why we are bothering about spin orbit coupling and spin mixing. So you've seen already this uh, picture at least twice during this conference, so you know everything about that. So basically this shows the state of the art about work on two-dimensional materials, this 2D Lego. And so what we can do, do thanks to the uh, material science and technology, so we can exfoliate individual layers so and then we can adjust the properties of those layers using several techniques called uh, universally functionalization to our needs right so for example either we can uh, absorb add items on the surfaces changing the electronic properties or we can make multi-layer single layers of the same material changing the properties like the dichalcogenides or we can also make heterostructures that strongly hybridize and change the properties or we can use uh, the proximity effects in these heterostructures to modify slightly the properties of the host material. But this is the way towards applications of the system. But I'm, I'm focusing on spintronics here and the central problem of spintronics uh, which uh, wants to store the information in electron spin is the how long the spin survives in the environment, in the material. So I will be talking about intrinsic uh, spin orbit coupling in these ma pristine materials uh, and basically try to give some overview of how this intrinsic spin orbit coupling behaves for a group of materials. So concerning spin relaxation there are several mechanisms of course that uh, uh, all together can be present, but let for example, Elio Diaffe, Diacon of Perel, or exchange interactions for magnetic impurities or hyperfine interaction. But for those materials which are undoped and there is no magnetic impurities that are relatively clean, those two, Elio Diaffe and Diacon of Perel, are said to be the dominant ones. So I will briefly sketch the idea behind those two mechanisms just to bring you some basics about that. 
So let me start from Elliot Yafet. So if we have the material that has the space inversion symmetry, then the spin states are degenerate, and then uh, we have no Rajba field, so there is no splitting of spin states. And due to spin orbit, intrinsic spin orbit coupling, the spin states are not, are not pure state, pure eigenstates of spin operator. They are, they are, they have up and down components. And this is what we call the spin orbit coupling, mix, coupling mixes spin states. But spin orbit coupling itself does not lead to spin relaxation. It needs some support. And in the Elliot Yafet mechanism, this support comes from the momentum scattering, either by non magnetic impurities or by phonons. And here is the sketch uh, of this mechanism. So we have these this, this black dots uh, are dopants, let's say, or the scattering centers. And here in between, there is electron which does not, which moves freely, freely in the sense, non in non -interact, don't interact with anything. So if we have a traveling electron with the spin up, so then at some, and it start starts to scatter its momentum from k to k prime, due to spin orbit coupling, there is a finite probability that spin orbit coupling flips its spin. But this flipping can happen only during this momentum scattering even, event. And Elliot uh, was the first who, applying perturbation theory, figured out that we can relate the spin lifetime, or spin, here is the inverse of spin lifetime, to momentum lifetime, or momentum scattering, and the quantity, this b squared, which is called spin mixing parameter. And the spin mixing parameter is introduced by the spin orbit coupling. And here this, this brackets, uh, uh, they describe that this b squared is the average over the Fermi contour for at a given energy. And what is important here, you see that the spin, mixing, spin lifetime is uh, proportional to the momentum lifetime, okay? Uh, and the second mechanism, Diakon of Perel, is enabled by uh, breaking of sp space inversion symmetry of our structure. For example, if you place your host material here on a substrate, you will break this symmetry, or uh, you include external magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of, the, uh, of our material. Then th the electron traveling with the velocity v uh, experience this static electric field as an effective magnetic field around which it starts to precess. And then the, the coupling of the magnetic field with spin is given by the Zeeman Hamiltonian, or the Zeeman-like Hamiltonian, and this magnetic field in the solid now is momentum dependent because spin orbit coupling is momentum dependent. So we have fluctuating with momentum uh, magnetic field around which the electron precess. And this is the sketch of this process. So again, those black dots are scatterers, like say momentum scatterers. And now the when electron travels from one scattering even to another, it precesses around randomly oriented magnetic field. And what happens when, when momentum scattering event occurs, then the we change the momentum, so we jump to another point of the Brillouin zone, and the effective magnetic field that electron experience also changes its value. So there is another frequency, Larmor frequency, which is, let's say, random due to the random orientation and random value of the spin orbit coupling. And this, this precession leads to randomization, if you now think of magnetization of many electrons that travel through the sample, then you, you see that you have randomization of the uh, spin phases, and this, li this leads to decoherence. And Diakonov and Perel, then, and here in this paper, they showed that spin, uh, spin lifetime, due to this Elliot Yafet uh, diakonov perel mechanism, uh, can be calculated knowing momentum lifetime, as before, times the spin orbit film, the or this Larmor frequency, like Fermi surface Larmor frequency. But here, what contributes uh, to this, let's say, if you inject spins oriented along I, let's say along Z direction, so this average is con the only the uh, components perpendicular to the spin orientation contribute. G they give only those give, uh, give torque to the spin, okay? So this, this, this mechanism leads to randomization of the spin phases and finally to the dephasing. And now what is, let's say, if you put all those two together 
And what if you want to extract the essentials of those, uh, basically you see those two formulas. And what you should remember is that in the Eliodiaphid mechanism, the more scattering you, the more momentum scattering you have, the more spin scattering you have. While in the diacon of Peral is the opposite. The more momentum scattering you have, the less spin scattering you have. And this is called motional narrowing. So the, the more s momentum scattering event you have, the less time spin precesses about this random magnetic field. And that's why momentum scattering stabilizes the spin in the system. And now the question is how we can distinguish in the experiment which of those is dominant, for example. So for sure we can use those two dependencies. But how we can measure the spin, for example, in graphene or in silicon and so on and so forth. In 1985, uh, Johnson and Silsby, they performed first experiment in spin injection and detection of this uh, magnetization into aluminum. And I will briefly sketch you how, uh, how this measurement is being done. So imagine that we have here is, is phosphorine, but we have our sample and we deposit ferromagnetic electrodes. Here there are these two source electrodes, here there are two uh, electrons which are for measurement. And what we do in this measurement, here we have the direction of magnetization of the ferromagnetic lead and we run transport current between this lead and this lead. So the transport current, spin polarized transport current flows from this lead to this lead but there is no transport current to the right because there is no voltage difference. But because of diffusion, spins will be also diffusing towards the right side. And because of spin orbit coupling, they will decohere and, and relax. And then we what we measure is we measure the non-local signal. So basically the chemical potential difference between those two leads. And if there is the, the difference of non-equilibrium magnetization below this lead and this lead, the volt non-local, what is called non-local voltage will, will be measured between those two ferromagnetic leads. And what people do to prove that we really have uh, in our experiment coherent magnetization but not incoherent, let's say, mixture, so they include here, apply either in plane to the magnetization or out of plane to the magnetization, magnet static magnetic field to see if they change the magnetization of one of the lead, they have the reversal of the signal. And for example, here we have zero magnetic field. The in-plane magnetic field be, par be parallel, now is parallel to the magnetization, is the axis. And we see the signal, so what you can notice here is that one of the, one of the leads is thicker than the other. So this changes the coercive fields, uh, the amplitude of the magnetic field when they switch the magnetization. So this thinner will switch quicker than the thicker. And then if the switching appears, we also we observe the, the voltage drop in this. And if you reverse the magnetization, we also see the voltage drop. And then when for large magnetic field, those and this is again the same polarized and there is no voltage. I mean, there is a voltage, but it's linear and there is no kinks in this voltage. And this effect is called spin valve effect and it proves that we have really coherent, trans coherent spin diffusion in our system. And this is uh, the plot of the non-local resistance versus magnetic field, but oriented perpendicularly to the injected magnetization. And then the spin precesses, if we inject now spins in plane and we have out of plane magnetic field, the spins will start precess, right? And they will of course scatter due to spin scattering, but the remaining magnetization will be also seen here on those two plots as a voltage or non-local resistance and you see the decay of the of this uh, magnetic voltage or non-local resistance and this is basically an oscillating function of the magnetic field and then how we can extract the values let's say spin spin mom relaxation time so this process of diffusion can be described by the diffusion equation and from the solutions of this spin diffusion equation we can basically we find a function of resistance or current, which depends on these three fundamental parameters as spin diffusion constant, spin uh, lifetime and external magnetic field we apply. So from this we can fit actually the signal to the solution to this equation using those two, three parameters. So this is the parameter but we fit those two and from that we can extract spin lifetime. 
And a uh, group from Singapore, Ahmed Afsar, who will be giving a talk next week, he did such an experiment for black phosphorus, few layers black phosphorus. This is exactly the, the sketch from the paper. So black phosphorus is a, uh, also Van der Waals material, which has very strongly packed honeycomb lattice structure. And I uh, encapsulated this uh, black phosphorus between on boron nitride and measured this non-local signal versus magnetic field. And from that, they extracted the spin and lifetime, and from separate transport measurement, they had momentum lifetimes. So this, the result of the main result of this paper is shown here. So you have two samples, and we'll see. on the red dots shows the momentum lifetime, black dots shows uh, show the spin lifetime. So what you see is that the spin lifetime really follows the momentum lifetime dependence. And if you remember this formula given at the beginning, how those two depend in the Elliot Yafet mechanism, you clearly see that the dominating effect comes from the Elliot Yafet mechanism. And we also did the theory calculations from first principles, esti like estimations of this B squared from, from black phosphorus. And what they extracted here was uh, the values of B squared, let's say, were uh, 10 to minus 5. And this is for in plane spin orientation. And we also get similar values. This is 0.6, 10 to minus 4, which is also the, order, the same order of magnitude. So we said, OK, we have nice agreement between theory. There was no fitting here between theory and uh, experiment. So why don't we use this apparatus we have to characterize this spin mixing in other two-dimensional materials? Because when we look at the literature, no one has done it. And this is fundamental somehow to know uh, what we can do. Yeah. So does that mean that the, the B parameters is temperature independent? The first picture you showing up there, tau so S and tau P are following each other as yes. a function of the temperature. So can you infer that from so band structure when you change the temperature? It's not changing much. Uh, so the DFT calculations are zero temperature here, but the temperature dependence is hidden in the momentum relaxation time. Yeah, but that's my point. It's only there. Yes. So B is time independent, uh, temperature independent. But as a fundamental quantity coming from the spin orbit coupling, it should be independent, right? That's uh, I'm, no, 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 I'm, I'm asking actually. Okay. It's <laughs> yes, but here is uh, here is this is this is basically the ratio between tau p to tau s. So this is what they measured. And you see no temperature dependence, but then, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's an experimental fact. I'm, yes. I'm thinking in terms of theory, whether if you change the temperature, not changing also the bed mixing a little bit. But yeah, but in theory, like how uh, Elliot showed it, it's temperature independent. So all temperatures incorporated in momentum scattering. Um, can I? I have a question following that. Uh, basically, this B term, you can think as an average around the Fermi surface, yes. right? But if, if you have temperature, this average will also include the Fermi Dirac distribution. So there should be some temperature dependence. It might be quite small at low temperatures, but uh, the temperature is there on the average. Yes, that's true. That's true. But we were doing only zero temperature calculations, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, so what we are interested here in this uh, in this talk is if we look at the group 14 or 4B and 515 of the periodic uh, lattice uh, of the uh, periodic table of the elements, we see that we have carbon, silicon, germanium, and so on, and we have group 15 of those elements. And most of those elements, uh, or the two-dimensional materials made of those elements as uh, elemental materials, has been either have been either predicted or already synthesized in the form of the uh, buckled graphene lattice-like materials. So, for example, we have some silicon. Silicon is well known to exist. Germanine, stannin, phosphorin has like two different kinds of. So all these materials have uh, crystalline structure of a honeycomb lattice, and all of them has uh, inversion symmetry. So if they, if they have inversion symmetry, we can calculate the B squared for them, and this is basically what I will show you now. So let me now go, this is the, the motivation behind. So the outline of my talk is, so briefly I will uh, recapitulate the spin orbit coupling and spin mixing, then I will tell you why it is important to do the spin orbit coupling in graphene once more. 
Then I will show you some results from the symmetry adapted model and how it looks like in rippled materials and show numerical results and then I will conclude. Okay, so let me start from the intrinsic spin orbit coupling. So if we have the two block states in our uh, band numbered by n at momentum k, so they compose of the lattice periodic function which has the orbital composition there, the spin part and the plane wave. And if there is no spin orbit coupling, the spin up and spin down block states are pure spin eigenstates, let's say. Those states are pure spin eigenstates, let's say eigenstates of sigma z operator. But once you turn on spin orbit coupling, it will admix the opposite spin. And the amplitude of this admixing is given by this ratio, where this is the spin orbit strand and this is distance to the band, to the other band that contributes to the spin orbit coupling matrix elements. So usually, this amplitude is very small, much smaller than the, the, the original ma amplitude. That's why we can still call this, this block states either spin up states or sp majority spin up states. And the same will happen to the spin, spin down block states, so they will get a mixture of the opposite spin, but still the majority of the states will be, will be spin up. And now if our system have, has the time reversal symmetry, so if we apply the time reversal operation to this, block states, so we will get complex conjugation, flipping of spin, and we will end up with, this with the state psi spin down minus k of r, which is the time reversal partner, and because of Kramer's theorem, we know that those two states are degenerate. And then additionally, if our system has the space inversion symmetry, so now if we change k to minus k, uh, so we applied it on this time reversal partner, we will end up with the state psi spin down and k. And now what we know from this that the two block states are always degenerate, two block subbands of band n up and down are always degenerate at every k point k in the, in the block, uh, in the Brillouin zone. So these are the two time reversal and space inversion partners and we know that they are degenerate. So now we can define the spin mixing parameter and we define it as the uh, unit cell in the integral over the unit cell from the modulus squared admixture amplitude here. So basically this is enabled by spin orbit coupling. If we take modulus squared, integrate over the all atoms in the unit cell, we will get the spin mixing parameter. So this is in principle where you could have some temperature dependence also coming in from the band structure. In your previous slide where you defined this B, lambda is spin orbit with delta, Delta could, in principle, yes, depend yes, on, yes, on, on, on temperature, right? That's so true. So whether it's irrelevant or not, I have no idea, but that, in principle, could be, yeah. Okay, so my answer was given referring to what I was doing, and I, I had in my always my calculations, okay? So, so sorry for that. Yes, but if you increase temperature, you have smearing, and let's say the band structure can differ a bit, and you have it really, the deltas can change, yes, that's true. Thank you. Okay, but now how we can uh, measure or refer this bit squared in the experimental setup? So as I told you before, we have this uh, uh, ferromagnetic electrodes and the easy axis of the magnetic electrodes, uh, so the orientation of the magnetization, we will be calling now spin quantization axis. So on this picture, the spin quantization axis is along Z direction, so it's out of plane, and it's defined by this unit vector S, okay? So when we polarize so the injected spins are along Z out of plane, so the spin quantization is, is called Z here. So then, the block states, we have we already shown that they are degenerate. The spin part of these block states here are eigenstates of sigma Z operator. So whenever I say spin quantization along Z, it means that the spin states here in the block part, in the block state, are eigenstates of sigma Z. And now, if we take the spin orbit Hamiltonian, the, the, the spherical symmetric form, we can see that the spin conserving term contains this SZ operator and it couples to the orbital part this LZ, but spin flip term consists of, consists of those two components, SX and SY. But if we now change the magnet orientation of the magnetization, let's say now the spin quantization axis is along X, so it's in plane, those two eigenstates, spin eigenstates, will correspond to eigenstates of SX operator. And now if you take a look at this Hamiltonian again, you will see that now spin conserving term is this one that contains SX operator, but spin flip terms are this one. And what you see from this is that whenever you have anisotropy of the crystalline structure, 
which is somehow hidden here in this L, you will have anisotropy of uh, spin orbit coupling in your in your system. Okay, so knowing this spin quantization axis, we can redefine our block states. So for a given spin quantization axis, is a given by these two equations. When now those eigenstates are also addressed by this super subscript S. And now having this, we can give an alternative definition of the B squared parameter as a one half minus uh, eigen uh, expectation value of the spin operator times the the versor S. And the same, def this definition changes if this is positive eigenvalue, if this is negative eigenvalue, we give here plus. And from this, we immediately see that this B squared changes from zero when we have no spin mixing because the expectation value is one half to one half when we have fully mixed spin states. So they say this B squared is one half, then we have one square root over two, square root over one over square root of two. So fully mixed states. Okay, so what information we can get knowing B squared? So we know that it's enabled by spin orbit coupling, so it tells us how much of this opposite spin and conon is being admixed. So we can measure, by knowing this B squared, measuring B squared, we can measure the strength of the spin orbit coupling in our material. We can measure the anisotropy of the spin orbit coupling in our material. And now if we keep in mind the connection given by Elliot, uh, knowing B squared, we can estimate the spin relaxation time when we know the momentum relaxation time. Okay, so let me now switch into graphene. So I will revisit the intrinsic spin orbit coupling in graphene and ask you or try to give an answer if it's important to really redo it or not. So some symmetry arguments at the beginning. So if we take this picture of the honeycomb lattice, so the ideal graphene lattice is flat it means that this delta z is zero. And the point group symmetry of graphene lattice is D6H. And the important thing is, this one of the symmetry operations that is really important is this mirror plane that lies in plane with graphe graphene lattice. Why is this important? Because if you look how the spin transforms under this operation, you will see that the spin z, because spin is actual vector, right? So it transforms like flip times minus one. So as z transforms properly, uh, along this uh, symmetry operation, but as x is not preserved when you transform it, and as y is also not preserved. So they do not transform under this op symmetry operation. So it what it means is that in perfectly flat graphene, spin can only have up, uh, z component. So it cannot have x on y components. What are the consequences of that? That if you scan the literature, that you will see that the effective intrinsic spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian is diagonal in spin, and this is the form here. Uh, we have here the, the valley, the sublattice, and there is a spin as z operator. So there is no spin scattering given by this Hamiltonian. And this is very, I think, the most widely used Hamiltonian for intrinsic spin orbit coupling in graphene. Uh, so using this Hamiltonian, we will see that B squared will be always zero because this is eig block states are always eigenstate of SZ. And what is important also about this, uh, ham this Hamiltonian is that it opens a gap at the k-point, but the gap from coming from p orbitals is only of the order of one micro EV, but if you include unoccupied d orbitals that are allowed by symmetry, then the gap increases by the order of 10 of micron evo and uh, electron volts. So the contribution from d orbitals to the spin orbital gap is essential here. Okay, and the question is, is there something missing when we use this effective Hamiltonian? Probably the answer w you would give is yes, right? Because it's effective, it's not the full one. So why what driven us to redo this intrinsic Hamiltonian was that I was doing this first principle calculations of B squared and I got non-zero values of the order of 10 to minus seven. And as that I said, okay, maybe it's a numerical error because you know it's heavy machinery, you can still get some precision you can try to converge it, but it's still still there. So then I did four orbitals later coster with only p S and P orbital, and I also got, no, got non-zero uh, parameter, but we say, okay, we need an analytical model to prove it by symmetry that it's really there. Th this non-zero B squared is really there, and then that was the moment that Paolo came to Regensburg, and that was the first, like I said, 
not the first, but the task we gave to Paolo, just to, okay, provide us the symmetry adapted model for that. And this is what he did. So now I will uh, describe shortly this model. So he did the effective Hamiltonian using the perturbation theory, symmetry adapted. So we, we consider the, the Dirac cone bands and these three bands lying far away in energy. So what is the physics behind? So if you have noise spin orbit coupling, the Dirac cone is degenerate, so there is no gap. And then in you include only Dirac cone coupling with itself bands, which we call intraband spin orbit coupling. It opens the gap, but spin expectations value are one half. So this is basically the effective Hamiltonian. But if you include the interband coupling, you will find that symmetry allows uh, to have non-zero, uh, so let's say w less than one half expectations value of a Z operator. And this already tells us that B squared should be non-zero for this Dirac cone bands in graphene, even if graphene is flat. So then we, Paolo, identify all these matrix elements here and diagonalize the Hamiltonian and we got two uh, eigenstates, eigenenergies, and then four, uh, two, two pairs of degenerate bands. These are conduction bands, these are these valence bands. And you see that this is gamma 5 is the representation of the Dirac cone bands and they have admixture of the opposite spin component coming from the low-lying Px and Py orbitals. So the physics is that Px and Py are essential to induce this mixing of spins. And due to uh, and now what we got from this is the expectation value of S X and S Y spin operators have to be zero because the symmetry still preserves the S those to to exist in graphene, but we have less than one half S Z expectation values. And what about d orbitals? So I told you before that the d orbitals are essential to have the proper uh, spin orbital gap. So can they contribute? So if we include d orbitals, we will get spin mixing without px and py. And the answer came from this uh, paper by Sergei Konshu and others. And he identified the, the, the admixture to the, to the Dirac cone bands from coming from the d orbitals. But when you go through the spin matrix, uh, to the sp through the matrix elements of the spin orbit coupling, you will see that you will end up only with a z spin operator. So the answer is no, d orbitals do not contribute to the spin mixing. Okay, so let me summarize uh, shortly this, this spin mixing in graphene. So symmetry allows mixing of spin states in flat graphene. Uh, this mixing occurs due to coupling of PZ Dirac bands with PX and PY orbitals. So multiband model is necessary. So s it's not possible to uh, describe this process in PZ orbital model. Uh, spin excitation value in Dirac cones is less than one half. And then the question is, can spin relax? Can, we, can the Elliot Jaffet be effective uh, mechanism of spin relaxation? And now if you calculate the product of, uh, let's say this gamma 5, V impurity, gamma, uh, those two uh, states, you will see that this is impossible to spin to relax via Elliot Jaffet mechanism because this state is even, this state is odd, but if, if impurity does not break the mirror plane, this matrix element will be zero. So symmetry uh, prohibits spin scattering in flat graphene, even if spin expectation value can be less than one, if even if we have spin mixing. This is somehow contraintuitive. Okay, so how does the physics change if we go into rippling, rippled materials? So if we introduce rippling, we have extra contribution to intrinsic spin orbit coupling. At the then there is a normalization of the lambda SO intrinsic, and there is a new term if in the Hamiltonian of spin orbit coupling called intrinsic Rajba or uh, PIA spin orbit coupling. And there is this contribution here. Though. So this is the classical one, the old one, and this is the new one. Uh, but from this definition, you see that at the K point where KA AKX is zero, it should vanish. So it only at K point we have only slight renormalization of the the, spin the lambda SO, but but this intrinsic Rajba will be uh, will be important if we go away from the K point. But because but what is important because of the spin inversion uh, space inversion symmetry, the spin states are still degenerate. So this new intrinsic Rajba does not break. Uh, the spin degeneracy of the of the eigenstates. 
Okay, now I'm showing you some results from first principles. I, was I used the Win2K code for this. So let me first now focus on the spin orbit uh, coupling gaps. What happens to the band structure? So we, as you know that if you include the relativistic effect, so we remove some degeneracies from the band structure. So I identify those, those spin orbital gaps as a delta SO at the K point and delta SO at the gamma point. So I extracted these values uh, from the DFT calculations. And if you go from graphene to silicon and germanine, so if you increase the atomic number, of course, the spin orbit strength should also increase and we should observe the increase of those or spin orbital gaps. And this is actually what happens. And now, uh, what is also important in these materials, and all those materials made of elements of group 14 are Dirac-like materials. They have the Dirac cone close to the Fermi surface and uh, they are basically semi-metals. But if you move to the group 15 from fo to phosphorine, arsenine, antimon, and bismuthin, so adding one electron uh, causes strong uh, influence to the band structure. So all of these materials now are indirect gap semiconductors with a sizable gap. And the Dirac cone here lies really low in energy, and it's not really important to the low energy physics here. And we also extracted here the, the spin orbital gaps from that. And if we increase the spin orbit coupling going from phosphorin to bismuthin, then we can identi identify that for bismuthin, the spin orbit strength is so, so big that we observe the inverted band structure already for bismuthin. Okay, so here I plot these uh, spin orbital gaps versus the atomic number. And what you can see is that basically for those three lines, we observe that the scaling of this de lamp delta SO is similar to is basically quadratic with the atomic number Z. And this is what we sh expect for valence electrons in isolated atoms due to screening of the core electrons, right? So there is some discrepancy for graphene and, uh, and the silicon at the K point, but we don't observe it at the gamma point. Okay, so basically what we find is that the strength of the spin orbit coupling scales roughly as uh, atomic number squared. Okay, now I will show you some results of B squared. So let me first focus on graphene here. So this is the aver Fermi surface average value of B squared versus the position of the Fermi contour, uh, measured with respect to the valence band minimum or valence band maximum or conduction band minimum. So first let's discuss the, the, the case when we inject spins being out of plane. So if we inject spins being out of plane, so all spins are polarized along Z, so we what we get is almost independent with doping value of B squared of the order of 10 to minus 7. And why is it so? Because if you go from here, you see that there is no bands being very close enough that could contribute to the spin orbit coupling to this band and, and uh, generate some abrupt changes in this. The same happens to the conduction band, and this is a consequence that this Dirac, band, Dirac cone is very well separated in energy from the other bands that could contribute to spin orbit coupling. But now when you inject spins being in plane, the situation changes a bit at the K point, which is called spin hotspot point. And because of this degeneracy here and here, we observe the full spin mixing if we inject spins being in plane. And then this, this hotspot uh, decays towards the same order of magnitude values if you increase uh, the Fermi, Fermi level. Okay, and now I give you a more general picture. So this is the B squared plotted for all materials made of group 14 elements. So we would say, okay, this is boring, nothing, nothing is uh, going on. Here nothing happens if we change the doping, and this is, as, as I said, the consequence that these bands here are well separated from the others. But what happens if another band will cross the Fermi contour? This is exactly uh, seen for stunning. So we s for stunning we start the valence band maximum starts at the gamma point when the spin orbit coupling is the weakest. So we have exponential growth of the B squared. And then when the Fermi, Fermi energy crosses this point, this contour, we have kink. And then another band contributes to the spin orbit coupling. And because spin orbit coupling is momentum dependent, so we don't know if, the, if we average over the Fermi contour, if it goes up or down, it's non-trivial, basically. But whenever another contour will cross the Fermi, the Fermi energy, we will observe a kink in the, in the B squared. Okay? 
The same thing happens uh, if we change the spin of quantization actions to be in plane. So we observe this, we have the spin hotspot due to degeneracy at the, at the K point. And with the lower the Fermi level, we will see that they decay towards the values for spin quantization axis along Z. Okay, what changes if we go from group 14 to group 15 material? So this is uh, now how it looks like. So here is the spin quantization axis along Z. So most of the material have valence band maximum at the gamma point when the spin orbit coupling is the weakest. So going away from the gamma point, we observe the exponential increase of B squared. And then whenever we experience another, fer another uh, band crossing the Fermi level, we have this, this, this continuous kink in our B squared dependence. Okay, the same happens in the conduction band. There is another band here coming. And in the, in the spin act quantization axis along X, we see that for the three, those three elements, antimon and arsenon and bismuthin, spins, the B squared is always of the order of 10 to minus 0.5, 0.2 which tells us that spins are always fully mixed. So what it tells you about spin relaxation, they would relax as fast as momentum relaxation happens. Okay, so how we can now summarize this B squared, how it uh, is, so let me now uh, summarize it. So the main factors determining B squared is when the band edge is away from the high symmetry points or the brilliance and boundaries, and it's relatively well separated from the other bands that could contribute to spin orbit coupling in this band, we observe no changes in B squared versus Fermi level. A discontinuous change of B squared takes place when a next band or different Fermi contour crosses the Fermi level. And this contribution to the average B squared is, is basically non-trivial because we don't know what's the strength of the spin orbit coupling at the second uh, K point. And at the brilliance on edges and time reversal points or anti-crossings, B squared is close to one half, which what we called spin hotspots. And at this point, the spin relaxation is as fast as momentum relaxation. Okay, and now the question is, uh, how we would expect this B squared to scale with the atomic number Z? So we know that rel relatively well, the spin orbital gaps scale with the atomic number Z as a Z squared, as for valence electrons in atomic, in, in isolated atoms. But now let's, let's check how this B squared scales with the atomic number Z. So if we apply the perturbation theory, so the correction to the state in the first order is proportional to lambda SO, but you know that B squared is given by the modulus squared of the admixture, so it should contribute as the square modulus squared of the spin orbit coupling strand. And we know that this lambda SO is depends as Z to power of two. So in total, what we should expect is that B squared depends as the power of four of the atomic number Z. So now I extracted the uh, B squared at uh, Fermi energy equal to 60 MeV. I choose this, this Fermi energy uh, as a proper one that we are away from any hotspots or another band that crosses the, cross the Fermi level. So here I plot both for group 14 and for group 15. So these are the, the points are the extracted values from first principles and lines are fits. So what we get is that B squared scales as the Z to power of 4.6 for the group 14 elements and Z to power of 4.8 for group 15 elements. So we can say, okay, spin orbit coupling is non-trivial. So there is many bands contributing via spin orbit coupling to the single band, which we want to measure the B squared. So relatively, we can say that, that relatively well, this B squared follows this Z to power of four dependence. So this is kind of surprising. Okay, and this brings me to the conclusion. So uh, we revisited uh, the spin orbit, intrinsic spin orbit coupling in graphene using the K dot P theory. So what we found is that Dirac cone bands are in fact spin mixed. So the spin expectation value is does not have to be one half. But non-zero spin mixing does not lead to spin relaxation unless we break the uh, inversion symmetry, uh, the, the mirror symmetry of the graphene lattice. So Elio Diaphet is not the, the proper mechanism of spin relaxation. And so we did the numerical calculations of B squared for rippled graph uh, graphene-like materials. And we find that both uh, spin orbit coupling strength and this B squared parameter follow the scaling laws with the atomic number. and 
what we can get from our paper is now uh, for our work is that we know already values of b squared so as as fast as we know the momentum relaxation time in a given material we can give an estimate to the spin lifetime in these materials and this this what i've showed you is can be found in those three papers so thank you for your attention any questions The experiment with the block black phosphorus, you show the ratio between uh, momentum relaxation time and spin relaxation time. So was it unique to measure sp momentum relaxation time by those experimentalists? Or because you're, you are matching with orders of magnitude, but uh, we heard from Pablo's lecture, if people try to explain 